Hey, good morning, everybody, and happy Thanksgiving. Okay, very excited around here. How about this, go Ducks? Okay, and some people are not very happy about that that are in the room. Okay, anyway, hey, today we're going to talk about the topic of gratitude is what we're going to talk about. We're going to talk about thankfulness. And so let's just get right to it. Here's a passage on the screen about thankfulness. Colossians chapter 3 verse 15 says, let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts since as members of one body you were called to peace and be thankful. There we go. Be thankful. Let the message of Christ dwell among you, uh, among you richly. Let the message of Christ dwell among you richly as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom uh, through psalms, hymns, and songs from the Spirit, singing to God with gratitude in your heart. So notice in that passage, we have the word thankfulness, and then we have the word gratitude. So we have both going on in that same passage. For me, I just think those are kind of synonymous words in a way in which we use to be thankful, be grateful. Another important passage with thanksgiving in it is 1 Thessalonians 5. It says, uh, rejoice always, pray continually, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Want to know the will of God in your life? Be thankful. That's what it says, right? If you want to be in God's will, be grateful, be thankful in all circumstances. And I think a key word in this is the word in. Don't be thankful for all circumstances, but in all circumstances. Bad things happen to us as people. Things happen. It doesn't say be thankful for those things. When you go to the doctor and he says you have leukemia, I'm not thankful for that, but I can be thankful in the circumstances. Well, big difference. That's the difference between maturity and just a masochism. It's just a masochist, you know, just enjoying pain. That's the difference. And so we want to be thankful in all circumstances, not for there are so many things today that are so difficult. Uh, uh, we're not thankful for uh, wars. We're not thankful for cancer. We're not thankful for, for uh, when somebody is the victim of a crime. We're not thankful for those things. But we can learn to be thankful in those circumstances. I'm not thankful when somebody is mistreated. I'm not thankful when somebody faces bigotry or something like that or an injustice. But we can give thanks in all circumstances. That's a discipline that we can learn. Even if your life is falling apart, you can learn to be thankful. It's something we can learn. So what I want to do today is I want to look at a story in the New Testament about Jesus. And I want us to look at uh, 10 lepers who come to Jesus and get healed, and only one is thankful. So we're going to look at this gratefulness from that perspective. So if you have a Bible, turn to Luke chapter 17 with me. If you don't have a Bible, it'll be here on the screen. But here we go. It's a story of thankfulness from the life and ministry of Jesus. Luke records, now on his way to Jerusalem, Jesus traveled along the border between Samaria and Galilee. As he was going into a village, 10 men who had leprosy met him. They stood at a distance and called out in a loud voice, Jesus, Master, have pity on us. When he saw them, he said, go show yourselves to the priests. And as they went, they were cleansed. One of them, when he saw he was healed, came back praising God in a loud voice. He threw himself at Jesus' feet and thanked him. And he was a Samaritan. Jesus asked, were not all ten cleansed? Where are the other nine? Has no one returned to give praise to God except this foreigner? Then he said to him, rise and go. Your faith has made you well. So Jesus and the stories on the border between Galilee and uh, and Samaria, it's in the northern part of Israel. I've been on that border, that ancient border before. Very uh, interesting place. And Jesus sees 10 lepers. And leprosy is a debilitating disease. And I'm sure each one of those 10 people had a story to tell. I mean, a story from hell, basically. Because when you get leprosy in the ancient world, it's a skin disease. And it gets on your, you know, starts with a small spot and then it grows, you know. And it's just debilitating kind of 
of a, of a disease. And, um, you know, it goes across your scalp, it gets into your lungs, it gets into your eyes, it gets into your throat, you start to wheeze. And the average person who gets leprosy of this kind in the first century would live about 10 years. In fact, your hair would fall out, your eyebrows would fall out, uh, uh, your fingers might fall off. I mean, it was a it was a devastating and highly contagious skin disease as well. And I want you to think about this. All 10, they were healthy at one point, right? They were healthy. And so when they were growing up, they were skipping rocks across the water. They were swimming. They were playing soccer. They uh, were playing catch with their dads. They were you know, reading books with their, with their mom, you know, just all those kinds of things. And maybe they had a family. Maybe someone had a family. Maybe, maybe it had been five years since they'd seen their kids. Just think about that. Five years since they hugged their kids. Five years since they hugged their spouse. Five years since somebody actually touched them. And you have to live in this kind of quarantine place as well. You got to be away from people. And what made it even worse in one respect is that if you had leprosy and you saw a crowd of people, you're supposed to yell, leper, leper. You can't get within 50 feet of a leper or you say unclean, unclean. And so they were stigmatized that way and very difficult time. And that's why some would say that they were the walking dead. Nobody nobody uh, spent time or hugged anybody with leprosy and they see Jesus in the distance. Let's picture this with 10 people who've been ostracized from society. They got this terrible disease that's going to kill them. And they see Jesus in the distance and they start talking among themselves. Is that the guy? Is, is that the guy who, who healed a blind person? Is that the guy who made a lame person who couldn't walk get up and walk? Is that the guy who touched somebody else with leprosy and healed them? Is that the guy who fed 5,000 people at once? Is that the guy who walked on water? Is that the guy? And they're debating among themselves, maybe it is the guy, maybe it's not the guy. What do we have to lose? What do we have to lose? And so they yell, have pity on us. And some of your translations will say, have mercy on us. And it's a statement that they're making, hey, we need some help. Jesus, will you help me? That's what they're calling out for. And then Jesus says, hey, go show yourself to the priest. This is very interesting because in, the, in that culture, the priest was the, uh, kind of the person in charge of his area. So they were in charge of quarantining people. So if you wanted to be around people, you had to go to the kind of like the doctor, you go to the priest in this case, and you get checked out. Oh, no, that's not leprosy. You can be around people. And so when Jesus says that, it's like a statement of saying, go because you're going to be clear. And they take a few steps, they're headed toward the priest's house, and uh, they get immediately cleansed. So just think about this, their, their eyebrows had fallen off or all of a sudden appearing. They were wheezing a voice because you can't talk, you got leprosy in your throat and down your lungs. And then your eyesight is bad because it gets into your eyes. It's just a terrible disease. And that's all restored. What would you do? I mean, they're giving each other high fives. They're skipping down the road. They're running to their families. They can't wait to say hi to friends. They can't wait to actually go into a store, maybe a restaurant, something like that as well. The leprosy was gone. Only one comes back, and Jesus points out a Samaritan. So here's the thing. In the first century, a Samaritan was hated by Jewish people. There was really a lot of conflict there, a lot of racism and bigotry and and I'm taking from the story, surmising that the others were Jewish, and he had one Gentile, a Samaritan. And so Jesus is making the point, hey, those who should be coming back and saying thank you said thanks for nothing. And this person came back and was grateful. He said, thank you. In fact, it says in a loud voice. He's very loud about this as well. Two strikes. You got leprosy. And you are a Samaritan as well. Okay. Hey, on the, uh, hey, the last verse, the last word there. Then uh, he said to them, rise and go. Your faith has made you well. Do you see the word well? Write this down in your program somewhere. Write the word sozo, S-O-Z-O. 
That's the word well in Greek. And that word literally means to be saved. It's the word salvation sometimes. And it means to be rescued. Sometimes it means to be rescued from a physical ailment, you know, like you broke your arm and you got healed and you're well now. So Jesus probably means it in both ways. You've, you're well from this disease, but also you're spiritually well. There's a spiritual salvation connotation here. So this person comes back and, and this wellness thing is just not physical. It's much more than that. Well, complete physically. You're well spiritually. Let's talk about gratitude. Number one, gratitude is an expression, not just an emotion. So gratitude, here's what I mean by this. Gratitude is a discipline we need to learn to be. We learn to be grateful in all circumstances, not for all circumstances. And so, but, but if I just feel it and don't express it, you know, in my mind, that's a fail. That, that's a fail right there. Choosing to be grateful is a choice. Anybody here uh, exercise this week? Whoa, well, good. Okay. How many of you thought about it and didn't do it? Okay, good. That's a fail. <laughs> I hate to point that out, right? It's kind of like gratitude, though. If I don't express it, that's a fail, right? right? It's a fail, okay? It's a, you got to demonstrate it as well. How many of you said, I'm not going to eat so much at Thanksgiving? And you did. Okay, there we go. Right. So that's a fail, right? Just because you feel it, but you don't do anything about it, you know, that's not where we need to be at, right? The whole purpose of gratitude is not that you feel it, but that you show it, that you express it, that you tell God, maybe other people. Gratitude that is not expressed is not gratitude at all. The story begins with the lepers calling out to Jesus, Jesus, have mercy on us, have pity on us. Only one comes back to actually express his thankfulness as well. So gratitude is more than just an emotion. It is something that we express. And actually, he comes down and he falls down at Jesus' feet. How about that? Loud voice. He's incredibly expressive in this. Incredibly in, in, uh, expressive in this as well. I was thinking this week about gratitude, and maybe many of you did too as well. And um, I know that sometimes we can complain with a loud voice. But sometimes we're not grateful with loud voices. We can be annoyed with people and express it loudly. But do we actually become thankful in a loud kind of way? A couple things about gratefulness. Here we go. The first one, ungrateful hearts are prideful. When we are not grateful, actually signifying that, hey, I'm responsible for everything I have in life, all the stuff I have. Um, all of my friendships and relationships, it's all about me. And, you know, you're just not grateful. Well, that's actually a place of a place of pride as well. It would seem to me we live in a society that's entitled. We have a lot of people who are entitled. And I come across young people who think, I'm going to start when I graduate from college at mid-management. I just would say, no, I think you're going to start at the bottom like everybody else. <laughs> I hate to tell you that. You're going to start at the bottom. Right, But we have this entitlement. And sometimes we think we're entitled to other things. I'm entitled to feeling happy. I'm entitled to a vacation. I'm entitled to new shoes. I'm entitled to this. I'm entitled to, you just name it, this entitled to all of those things. I'm entitled to the best school for my kids. And I'm entitled to a nice parking spot at Costco. Okay. But here's what happens, I think, when we... When we have this entitlement attitude, it actually kills gratitude because our expe expectations are up here and things aren't met, and then I become ungrateful. It's kind of like this. We have this idea, I think, some, you know, in a way in which we think God owes me something. God owes me a happy marriage, a happy family, and that didn't work out. God owes me a better job. God owes me this. I wanted to decent car that didn't break down all the time. And we just kind of whine and we think God owes me. And when it doesn't happen, we become very ungrateful, very ungrateful. That's a pride and humility kind of thing at work right there. The person who has a grateful attitude believes that they don't owe God anything except to be grateful as well. So entitlement can kill that as well. I did a little word search and here's only very few verses in the Bible that talk about being ungrateful, but here's one. 2 Timothy 3, 
It says this, but mark this. There will be terrible times in the last days. People will be lovers of themselves. They'll be selfish. Lovers of money, boastful, proud, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful. So this ungrateful thing is a big deal. It's in the same category as lots of things that we would go, oh, that's not good. It's on the, you know, this ungratefulness. And literally, this word ungrateful means lack of grace. Because the word grateful, its root word is gracious. And so when we don't have gratefulness, we lack grace ourselves in our lives. I'm going to guess that people who are ungrateful are not even aware of it. It's kind of like this blind spot. We don't see it, and we're not realizing that we are ungrateful. In Luke 6.35, the passage says, He is kind even though we are ungrateful. So the idea is that Jesus is kind to us even though we don't respond back to Him as well. I have this little theory. You can talk about in a car. You can say, Pastor Steve, just swing and a miss today. But uh, I think that we tend to be grateful for things and ungrateful for people. Grateful for things, ungrateful for people. Now, wh here's what I mean by this. I think usually we get thankful for our bank accounts, our cars, our houses, our golf clubs. All of the toys that we had, we become grateful for those. But we become ungrateful for people. And we think, oh, you know, my workplace would be so much better if that one person wasn't there. If that one person wasn't there, oh, man, I wish they weren't there. Or you think of your own family. You think, oh, it's Thanksgiving. i got to be around so-and-so, you know, and you're just ungrateful for people. So we tend to be critical and judgmental of people and ungrateful for them. Gratefulness. We need to learn to be grateful. It's a, something that we have to learn to be. And we tend to be ungrateful with annoying people. I've got news for you. You hear? Everybody in this room is annoying. You're welcome. <laughs> and we have annoying people in our lives. We just do. At work, in your home, I just... Uh, you run into annoying people, but we're annoying to each other. So we have to learn to be grateful for people. Here's the next thing about great. Grateful hearts are humble. We're grateful and we're, we're humble because we know that everything we have, every relationship we have, every friendship we have, every material thing, all our stuff comes from God. It doesn't come from us. It comes from God. And I can be grateful for a couple of things from God. One, as I thought about this week, is I'm grateful for forgiveness. God forgives my sin, my rebellion, my disobedience. I want you to stop and think about this. Every bad attitude you've had, every sinful thought you've had, every time you lived outside of God's will, every time you deliberately disobeyed and were rebellious, the very moment you believed in Jesus as your Savior, at that very moment, He gives you forgiveness. Guilt is dealt with. Guilt is dealt with. And you have this eternal life. I can be grateful for that. I can be so grateful for that. If you knocked on the door of heaven and said, God, I'm not sure. Do you remember I did all that stuff? He'd go, Pfft. We're not holding that against you. Come on in. Right? Just not holding it against you. In fact, the Old Testament says your sin is stretched as far as from the east to the west. It's like it's disappeared. It's not holding it against you anymore. I want you to think back about all the wrong stuff you did in the last 30 days. The text message you shouldn't have sent. The email you shouldn't have sent. What you thought of a coworker. What you really wanted to say to your spouse and you didn't how you treated your kids, how you treated your parents. You just think through about all those things and realize that God is gracious and he still offers forgiveness. I can be grateful for that. I can be grateful that God, the Bible says that God heals the brokenhearted. I've noticed lately there are a lot of broken hearts around the world. A lot of people have gone through some really bad experiences. 
facing depression, mental health issues, financial issues, you just name it. And there's a sense of brokenheartedness. How would you answer this question? If it wasn't for God, I would be blank right now. And here's what I mean by that. I was writing down some things and, you know, if it wasn't for God, I would have poor self-esteem. If it wasn't for God, I would have a lack of confidence. If it wasn't for God, I'd be broke. If it wasn't for God, I'd be an addict. If it wasn't for God, I'd be a chain smoker. If it wasn't for God, I don't know how many times I'd be divorced. If it wasn't for God, I'd be angry. If it wasn't for God, I'd be quick-tempered. If it wasn't for God, you just, if it wasn't for God, just think about your life in, in those terms. Begin, because then all of a sudden you'll think, I am grateful for everything that God has given to me. Getting grateful takes a couple things. One thing is, I think, and I'm just pulling this right out of the story, it takes asking. And we need to see God work sometimes. And so the people of leprosy, they ask Jesus, hey, Jesus, have mercy on us, have pity on us. And they yell that across the, the distance. And Jesus hears that. And Jesus responds, go show yourself to the priest. And they turn and walk away. And they're instantly healed. I mean, holy cow. Really, really amazing. I'm guessing that everybody in this room has a problem right now of some kind. Now, you might have a level 10 problem, like it's so overwhelming, or a level 1 problem, but the only people who don't have problems are in the cemetery out on West 11th. Everybody else has a problem of some kind. No one sails through life without problems. There is no problem that you have that God cannot do something about. There's no problem that God is not too powerful to handle. There's no problem that God does not know about. There's no problem too small for God's concern. What problems are you facing right now? Ask God to intervene. Ask God. He's not too big. The second thing is obeying. That's simply they went and found the priest. They turned to go back to that priest. There is a sense in which the lepers heard Jesus' message and responded as well. God has a design for every aspect of life. He has a design for our relationships. He has a design for how you uh, spend your money. He has a design for relationships and marriage. He has a design for parents and children. God has a design for how we live our lives in the workplace. God has a design for every aspect of life. Now, it would seem to me that since God is the architect of everything, and he has a design for how we live, live our lives, then when we live in that design, we will enjoy fellowship with God. I will feel fulfilled. But once I try to find fulfillment outside of God's design, then I become ungrateful, I become unfulfilled, and I try to find every way under the sun to fulfill my life that's outside of God's perfect design. So that's why it's so critically important that we become people who are well acquainted with the Word of God, with the Bible. Scripture is amazing. Jesus is awesome. And once we figure out how to walk with Him, it helps us to become grateful. Obeying God, you got to know Scripture. Number three, let's talk about this. How do we express our gratefulness, expressing gratefulness to God? First thing is learn to be a generous person. Learn to give. Thanksgiving. There's thanks and there's giving. So when we're thankful, we give. Deuteronomy says in the Old Testament, celebrate the harvest festival, one of their Jewish festivals. Honor the Lord your God by bringing him a free will offering in proportion to the blessing he has given you. Be joyful in the Lord's presence together with your children. Learn to give. Learn to be generous with your finances. I know we just had our uh, pledge thing up here. We'll announce that in a couple weeks where we're at with that. But that's just one way. We have we have a giving here on the sides of the, of the room where all these gifts are. I guess it looks like all the tags are gone now. We'll probably have more coming. But just another way to be generous to the people in our community. So we give. This is Christmas. We're headed to Christmas, right? Right? Here's what I do. 
I go to the bank. I've been doing this for quite a few years. I pull out $100. I usually get two fifties, and then I carry them with me for 30 days. And here's what I do. When I see somebody that has a need, I give them $50. Some of you are saying, where will you be? <laughs> but I've been doing this a long time, and I just carry that cash with me. And so it might be somebody at church, might be somebody I just meet. I go, you know what? I was talking to that person, and you know what? I give them $50. In the name of Jesus. You know, I phrase it in a way that kind of start a conversation. Anyway, I just wanted to, maybe you should do that. Maybe that's something, you know, just learn to be generous. And so that's why I look out for those families that look like they need a little help, somebody that looks like they're down and out, and I just carry that $100 with me. One day I was sharing this about 10, 15 years ago, and this guy comes up to me and gives me $300 right after the service. And I said, what's that for? And he goes, because of my job, I travel all the time. And uh, he says, I drive a truck. I'm not around people. I want you to give that away for me. And I said, I can do that. So that year, I gave $400 away. <laughs> you know what? Giving blesses me. And when I express my gratefulness by giving, it's just incredible. So I can give my money. I can give my time. I give my time. Absolutely. Well, I know people give their time at the Eugene Mission, which you're really tied into, maybe at the school around the corner as well. Maybe give time to, kid, to our children's ministry, our kids' ministry, given your time. Maybe you know somebody on your street. You go, I should go over and say hello to them. I just want to... Maybe they need a little help. Maybe they need their gutters cleaned. I don't know. You have to figure that out. How can I give my time? So we can give our funds. We can give our time. We can give our talents. I look at this between this service and our first service. Go, there's so many talented people here. We have people who are good at computers and good at listening and good at, good at fixing things and good at administration. Well, give your talents away. Give those things away. Learn to use those for the kingdom of God. Say, God, I'm so grateful you gave me the talent of being organized. I would love to come to somebody's house and throw away all their junk and help them get organized. Some of you are like, that's heaven for me. Some of you are good at computers, good at technology. You're good at cars. You're good at something. Use your talents for the kingdom of God. Here's the next thing to express your gratefulness. Say it. Get the words out of your mouth. God, I'm thankful. I'm thankful. In the words of the great American theologian, Bart Simpson, before the meal, he was asked to pray. He said, dear God, we paid for all this stuff ourselves, so thanks for nothing. It's just a cartoon, don't worry. <laughs> Sometimes we just have to say to God, thank you so much. How do we say thanks for God? Well, we give him the credit. You have an example. Let's say that you lost your job. You lose your job and you, you just don't know what to do next. But you're in a small group here at Grace. So you're telling your group, I lost my job. And one of them says, hey, uh, I'm pretty good at writing resumes. You want me to help you? Oh, yeah, I'd love that. So that person helps you write a resume. And then somebody else says, hey, you know what? I'm good at those websites and how about I help you navigate those websites to find work? Oh, man, that would be, that would be helpful. And about a, six weeks later, you find out, hey, I, I think I have an interview coming up. And somebody else in your group says, I'm good, at, I'm good at interviewing. When's the last time you interviewed? And you say, it's been 10 years. And you go, hey, I do this at my work. And so let me help you with those answers to those basic questions that stump everybody. And let me help you with that. Oh, that'd be great. As well. And then somebody else in your group says, you know what? I heard about a job. Where? It's at that company over there on West 11th. Oh. So you send in a resume and all that kind of stuff, and you get an interview. It goes nowhere. But then they told you about another job. 
you found out about one because of the interview, and you go interview there, and you feel like you nailed it. I nailed that interview. You get very excited. You tell your group, I, we, I nailed that interview. Then you get the job. Now, here's the question. Are you going to tell your group, I wrote such a great resume, I networked well, I hit that interview, I was good. But are you going to say, I'm so thankful to God, and I'm so thankful for all of you, because it wasn't for the Lord, if it wasn't for all of you, I don't think I would have gotten the job. That's thankfulness, and you say it out loud. You say it. God, I'm thankful for the people in my life. I'm thankful for you. Isaiah chapter 12 says, Thank the Lord, praise His name, tell the world about His wondrous love and how mighty His works are. So we tell people. We call that a testimony or a witness. You know, I was a witness once in a case. It was a civil case. I was deposed. It was a fairly large civil case. And I was... Uh, interviewed, and uh, I just simply answered the question. Here's what I saw. Here's what I heard. And uh, they didn't use any of my testimony case. <laughs> but I've been to other court cases, and maybe you've seen them on television, and sometimes I go to support people, and I'm there, and, and I'm watching. I've been in a, maybe 10 courtrooms over the years, and people get on the witness stand, and they just say, this is what I saw. This is what I heard. This is what happened. You're just sticking with those things. Now then, if you're a believer in Jesus Christ, then you tell other people about it. It's one way you say it. I'm so grateful. This is what God did in my life. Here's what was going on in my life. My marriage, I didn't think it was going to survive. And I want to tell you something, that we went to this marriage coaching thing at our church, and you know that was seven years ago, and and man, the Lord really did something in my life and in my spouse, and this is where we are today. See, that's giving credit to God. Where you say, man, I was just about flat out, you know, lost everything financially, and then I went to one of those classes at church and learned more about financial management, and I want to tell you what, God did something. Or maybe you got children, and you say, man, my kid, I just, I have teenagers, pray for us. But anyway, so... You have kids, and you say, man, it's all going sideways. And then somebody else comes up, and that was happening in my life. Let me tell you what happened. And here's what God did. Here's how God intervened. If God can do it in my life, he can do it in yours. That's giving credit to God as well. That's called a testimony. Carl Menninger is a famous psychiatrist, medical doctor. He wrote, Generous people are rarely mentally ill. It's a sign of mental health, generosity, and gratitude. We need to be grateful to God. We need to be grateful for other people. You got your phone in your hands? Well, now you do. Everybody pull out your phone. We have homework right now. No, you're not checking your fantasy football score. <laughs> I'm tempted to click on mine, but I refuse to. Okay, so I, I want you to, here's what we're going to do. We did in the first service. Pull out your phone, go to your contacts, and I want you to text somebody something really simple. I'm thankful for you because. Keep it short. Don't send them a book. Okay? So you just find We're just going to do this together as a group. Don't text me, by the way. I don't get a whole bunch of them coming up. Okay, you just find somebody and you go, I should text that person. And just tell them, I'm thankful for them, and tell them why. You know, that would be incredible to do. And so I'm looking here, and you can look at yours, and let's see. Yeah, you're looking for somebody. Great, everybody's doing a second. Finally found my person. It took me a little while. I'm slow. Thankful. 
I'm texting a pastor friend of mine in Idaho. His name is Larry Walton. He's going to be shocked that during our church service, I text him during his church service. <laughs> Just realized that. And now that Sandra here, and we probably mess him up. <laughs> and some people are texting me. Don't do that. <laughs> Now I want you to think about this. So you just texted somebody, or you're going to think about it, and maybe you need to text three or four people to let them know how thankful you are for them. And maybe that leads to another conversation that you need to have. Maybe it's just an expression of your joy, and you're so grateful for them and all that they've done in your life, and you just want to express that. That's amazing. Here's the last thing to express it. Sing. Sing. Give, sing. Give, say, sing. Give, say, sing. Psalm 100 says, Shout for joy to the Lord, all the earth. Worship the Lord with gladness. Come before Him with joyful songs. Know that the Lord is God. It is He who made us, and we are His. We are His people, the sheep of His pasture. Enter His gates with thanksgiving and His courts with praise. Give thanks to Him and praise His name. For the Lord is good, and His love endures forever. His faithfulness continues through all generations. Let me tell you something about singing. Singing is an expression of gratitude because when we sing, we're pouring out our emotions to God. God is emotional. God loves. God. The Bible says God loves. He gets angry. He grieves. God, God has emotions. So we're supposed to love Him back. Love God with all your heart, soul, and mind. And when we sing, we're actually expressing that to God. Now, I know some of you don't sing. And I know some people will just come to hear the message and they'll leave before, after the singing or after the message. You're making a big mistake because singing is part of the Christian life. It, it's part of it. The person who came back to Jesus came back with a loud voice being thankful. And so when we sing together, we're being thankful to God. Now, some of you say, I can't sing. Well, the Bible says, make a joyful noise. Make a joyful noise. Okay. Even pigs do that when they're eating. <laughs> some of you say, I can't sing as well. Some of you are prison singers. You're always behind a few bars. <laughs> Some of you need to cultivate your singing. Just plow it under and kiss it goodbye. <laughs> but no, we are to make a joyful noise to God. We are to express ourselves through music. Christianity is a singing faith. And let me tell you something. At the very time that you're at the lowest is probably the time you need to be here to express to God and to sing. I see more people crying during the singing than any other time. Some people go to sleep when I preach. Not very many people cry, but I see lots of people weeping during the music because they're so touched emotionally. I just want to speak to the people who are online. Any given week, we have about 150 to 200 views online. And if you stay home because you've gotten lazy from COVID and you're just sitting on your couch, you are missing the boat. I just want to tell you that you need to show up because you will not be growing if you're not showing up and you're just fooling yourself and deceiving because we need to express our gratitude to God and we need to do it corporately. So if you've relegated yourself to a couch churched person, you need to get off that couch. Now, I know sometimes we're sick or other things. We're watching online all for that. Often it's an on-ramp for people who are just checking out Christianity, checking out church, all for that. But if you're a believer in Jesus Christ, you need to show up, okay? You need to show up. Singing is a way to express our gratefulness to God. And I've discovered that the most lowest points of my life, I need it more than ever, is to come here and sing to God and to worship Him and to express how much I need Him and how grateful I am. Thankfulness. What are you grateful for today? I'm going to pray, and then we're actually going to sing four songs at the end, not three, because we want to emphasize how we can respond to God and express our joy and gratitude. Heavenly Father, 
Thank you so much for all that you've given to us. Thank you for erasing our sin and guilt. Thank you, Father, that you provided eternal life for us. God, we are grateful that you have rescued us from despair, rescued us from discouragement. God, we are a grateful people. God, you are awesome, and we love you. And we pray this in Jesus' powerful name. Amen.